Okay, here are two people catching guppies, and they're illustrating some of the ways in which we collect the guppies in each of the it, it, throughout the length of the stream. When we have a large pool, a discrete pool, then we'll use a minnow trap, which you can see sitting on the inside of the stream. And inside that minnow trap, there's like a little pocket, and in that pocket, we'll put pellets of dog food. So the fish never actually get to eat the dog food, but the dog food has a nice odor, and it attracts fish into the trap, so it's a lure. We don't want to be actually adding dog food to the ecosystem. We want the nutrients that are available there to be just the ones that are naturally part of the, the guppy environment. In addition to catching them in the trap, we also catch them by hand. And in fact, probably much more capture happens in hand nets than in the, in the minnow traps. The minnow traps serve as a magnet to bring the guppies out. Guppies aren't very shy, and if they think there's something good to eat, then they'll come right out into the open, and then you can collect them with nets. The person in the front, who you'll meet in just a minute, is Corey Handelsman, and he has a net in each hand. And what we usually do with these long butterfly nets is you'll play the guppy from one net to the other and chase them inside the net, which means that you can extract them from the stream without actually disturbing the local environment. If you're going to be doing this kind of repeated census month after month, then the idea is to be able to pull the guppies out of the stream without disturbing the local habitat. And the nice thing about guppies is that you can do that. If you're in the stream and you're creating a little bit of disturbance perhaps and stirring up some sediment, most fish would respond to that by swimming and hiding. Guppies respond to it by acting as if it were a magnet. They, they smell what's been stirred up from the bottom and they'll come out because they want to see if there's anything good to eat that you've generated through part of your activity. And so it's possible to sit still on the shoreline and study the bottom and see the guppies as they move out into the open and then just play them from one net into the other and extract them without doing much more than leaving evidence of your footprints on the shore. I also want to ask these two guys if they would introduce themselves to us. Back is Andrew. Yeah, I'm a, Maybe take off your hat so okay, we can see you. Okay. I'm Andrew Furness. I'm uh, beginning my second year as a graduate student at UC Riverside, where David is my advisor. So I'm here for the fall quarter, helping with the guppy market capture. Okay. And? I'm Corey Handelsman. I'm a graduate student at Colorado State University, where I uh, do a lot of work with this project, and I'm specifically interested in how the body shape of these fish is changing on a monthly basis as they adapt to the new environment. Okay, do you want to tell us a little more about body shape and yeah. why it's important? It appears that there seems to be different strategies for dealing with the types of predators that the fish encounter in different environments, and up here in these low predation sites, what we find is that there's a uh, rivulus who will prey on juvenile guppies and they can escape them by typically exhibiting a dip deeper body. And down in the high predation environment, they'll have a more streamlined body that seems to manifest itself in greater acceleration by larger perceivers fish. And so we've been documenting how in less than six months, basically, you can see a shift where the fish that came from a high predation environment are starting to actually look more and more like low predation fish every month. Okay, so they're not looking like low predation fish. It's their offspring who were born yeah. here and grew up here. Yeah. You want to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, so there's a some degree of uh, plasticity in their development, but it seems that generation after generation, the progeny they're left behind are starting to look more and more like the native fish from what we'd expect in a population that's locally adapted to an environment like this. Okay, so when you say that they're changing over time, their parents look the way they had, but the babies, presumably, I said in an earlier segment that about... 80% of the babies do not survive to the 14 millimeter size class. It's the first size class that we'll collect and mark. And so part of what's implied by Corey's work is that the 20% that survive are a non-random 20%, that they're somewhat different in shape from the 80% that did not survive. Yeah, exactly. They seem to look a little bit more like we'd expect every, each time we see, you know, we'll, eventually we'll look at it on a generation by generation basis, but it's it's almost like that mark of directional selection that's uh, moving the population towards whatever the local optimum is in these new streams. So the other thing that, that's interesting about this is that because these guppies are genotyped, we know who their parents are. And it turns out that with each census, we photograph the parents. And so what Corey's going to be able to do is not just measure the new generation and look at their shape, but to go out and to go back and compare the shape of these new recruits with the shape of their parents and try to relate the change in shape to differences among parents and their reproductive success. And that's something that we can do in this study, which has almost never been possible before in prior studies of, for example, body shape um, and you know, body shape and how shape might be an adaptation in fish. Thank you very much, Corey.